What is going on, fellas? It's your boy, GS Luke, here with a course breakdown for this week's Bermuda Championship. Going to cover everything you need to know about Port Royal Golf Club, the home for this week's tour stop, whether it's our key stats for analysis, our comp courses, a hole-by-hole -hole breakdown of what to expect. You'll be experts by the end, and whether you're playing DFS or outright betting for this event, you'll be armed with all of the knowledge that you need. So let's not waste any time at all and get this thing rocking. Port Royal Golf Club, a Robert Trent Jones design, has been recontoured a few times by RTJ over the years, but a par 71, and most notably, only 6,828 yards. So, on the shorter end of the spectrum, the second shortest golf course in all of the PGA Tour, behind Pebble Beach, which is just 10 yards shorter, but in general, relatively easy golf course, but it all comes down to the wind. So, we'll talk about a lot of these metrics, but it'll change wildly from day to day, depending on the prevailing winds, which on any coastal track, particularly in Bermuda, where we are for this place, you know, you're going to get extremely strong winds and winds that vary hour to hour, even minute to minute out there. Um, you see scoring averages around this track well over par, something close to one, maybe one and a half over. And then some years, like when Brendan Todd won, when you're get, going to get a 24 under par winner and a scoring average close to one under par. So there's a wide range of what we can expect from this golf course in day to day. The demand from the golf course, at least from a skill set perspective, can change as well. There can be rounds where around the green are a lot more important than most. There can be rounds where off the tee play is more due to distance than it is your accuracy. So on and so forth, it could just flip-flop in one direction or the other. So we really have to pay attention to that forecast. So, you know, when we go through some of these metrics here, just keep that in mind that it will change wildly from day to day. But in general, the scoring average was 0.24 strokes under par, which was a 70.76 on this par 71 setup. The greens are right around tour average, but they were only hit at a 64.1% clip, which was about 4% lower than what we're used to seeing on tour. And they are a Tiff Eagle Bermuda running at right around 11 on the stint meter. So towards the slower end of the spectrum, which you'll see on most coastal courses, particularly any coastal course with any sort of undulation, uh, you're going to see that to combat some of those strong winds. You know, with super strong winds, any undulation on a green, it's really hard to get your ball to stop. So that's their way to combat that. The fairways are Bermuda 2. They are a 419 Bermuda, and they tend to be relatively narrow. So despite being just a 6,800-yard golf course, um, off the tee play can be a little bit difficult here. And that is most notable when you look at the FIR percentage, um, so fairway percentage at 55.9%, which is a whole right about 10% lower than what you're used to seeing on tour. So even though it's a short course, you're clubbing down a lot off the tee. You're dealing with relatively narrow landing areas. Now we don't have an exact metric on that, but based on what we've seen on TV, the low fairway percentage, all of that is extremely evident to us. So a lot of times people have focused on driving accuracy, but as long as you're not missing heavily offline into penalty areas, there's water on five holes. You also have a few wooded areas that you can get into, but they're it's mostly wide open. You can mostly get away with an, a ride tee shot. Um, off the tee accuracy isn't as important as some people would expect. So the fairway percentage is low. I just wanted to note that. And part of the reason why is the rough is only two inches long. So this is a resort style course over there in Bermuda. It only hosts one tour event every single year and it's the Bermuda. So it's not like we're talking about a major championship. Uh, so it's a two inch zoysia grass. So it's a little bit penal. Anytime you have zoysia, it tends to be a little bit more sticky than most grasses. It's kind of similar to a kakuya grass, which is a lot stickier than, you know, similar types of rough at that same length. But anytime you only have about a two inch rough, it's not going to be that penal. So and you miss here, it's not all that penal. We don't have an exact metric on the penalty strokes per shot out there for data golf, uh, but I would imagine it's right about tour average at most. So the main things to note here are the short, you know, design, right? It's a par 71, so you have the three par fives and also some elevation change. So that's something that we'll go through when we look at this hole by hole, but there are quite a few drastic changes in terms of elevation, which adds a little bit of creativity. There's a lot of undulation in the fairways and on the greens as well. So there's a specific type Type of golfer that we're going to be looking for pretty much regardless of conditions i mean on windy days we want the players with a lower ball flight that have 
historically been better in windy conditions. And then on the easy, more scorable days, we want the guys that are bombers that are higher birdie or better percentage sort of players. So we're going to be looking at that. But when we go hole by hole, like we said in here a second, you're really going to see the, the creativity aspect and where I think we can take advantage of it. All right, we've got Pro Visualizer up and we'll real quickly go hole by hole to give you a little taste of what these players are facing. So hole number one, maybe not quite the handshake that you'd expect. It's a dogleg to the right. And if you miss the fairway here, it really does bring this little lake into play. So one of the five holes on property, but you are gonna have to deal with an approach shot over water. Um, a lot of room to the left, even these bunker shots aren't all that bad, right? It's 160, 170 yards. You miss to the right though. There's an OB if you go far enough right and this little patch of trees is penal. So you got to keep it in play, hit an iron off the tee, get it in the short stuff, and you're looking at most likely what is going to be a birdie look. Hole two is a par five, so the first true scoring opportunity that players will have. You can take some of the bunkers out of play if you're a longer player. You can see as of right now, it's just set up for a 250-yard tee shot, so clearly you can get it out there further than that. It does play slightly uphill for your tee shot. Uh, most players, though, We'll have the length to get it over this little patch here. So that's a 300 yard carry. If you can do so, you're gonna be left with right around 240, maybe even 220 yards or less into the green, which should be a clear look at Eagle. Hole three is 148 yards, so a short par three. You do have water in play, but unless it's a front left or a front pin location, I don't even know what to call it, like front right, front middle pin location, um, it's not going to bring it too much into play. This back left pin is going to be a huge birdie look. It's only like 160 yards. And a back left pin, though you do have chipping hollows over the green, should be a birdie look given that it's a pitching wedge, maybe a nine iron at the very most for these tour pros. Hole four is 460, a slate dog leg from left to right. This is on the difficult end of the spectrum. I would classify this as one of the harder holes on property. But even still, right, hit the fairway here. Three wood can get the job done. If you use driver, you can take these bunkers out of play. It's a hole that you should at least be able to make par on. Now, if the winds are coming in off of the water over here and you're playing into a prevailing wind, then a 460 yard hole maybe plays closer to 500 yards. Then it becomes a different equation. So that's where some of this wind factor starts to come in. And of course, if the wind is coming in the opposite direction, that helps out on that hole, but then you're playing this scorable par four into the wind, and it's no longer a little pitch and putt into the green. So you can see where the wind starts to affect the golf course. And even if it's a side wind where you're getting a lot of crosswind action, it makes hitting these greens and you know hitting your spots for birdie extremely difficult. So it's exposed. You can see there are patches where you have natural areas, a few wooded areas like we had there on hole number one, but most of the course is exposed to the wind. Hole six is another short par four. So a pitch and putt if you're playing downwind into the wind a little bit more tricky. Uh, yet another scoreable hole right after hole five. Hole number seven is your second par five. It is the most difficult tee shot on property though, where you have those three fairway bunkers in play. The rough isn't all that penal like I mentioned, so a lot of people will miss to the left or right here, leaving a slightly more difficult angle into the green, but it should be a birdie look. And you've probably noticed it to this point, a lot of birdie looks and a lot of more difficult holes. So it's extremely variant. You're going to see a lot of players that make five or six birdies and then hardly end up shooting even part. And this is a great example of it. Get them on the fairway here. You're going to have an eagle look. Another difficult hole is hole number eight, right? 212 yards um, coming right into the wind if it's coming off the water over here. Uh, if it's playing into the wind, this will be an absolute bear. Could even play like 3.5, 3.6 shots there for the par three. Hole nine is 384, so shorter. So definitely a scoreable hole as long as you're not playing directly into the wind. But you may have noticed that all three of these quote unquote drivable par fours play in the same direction. And the prevailing wind is from this direction. So most of the time, they aren't gonna play nearly as easy as you would expect. And they're certainly not gonna be drivable if that's the case. Hole 10, another short par four in the same direction. It's like they did it on purpose or something, right? Robert Trent Jones knew what he was doing out there. 348 yards, again, into the prevailing wind most days. Um, should be a birdie look as long as it's not too windy out there. But, you know, when it kicks up, you're going to be dealing with a much more difficult hole than people expect on paper. Hole 11 is 440. It's... I mean, I, I feel like I'm a broken record at this point, so we're just going to go through them rather quickly, right? It's relatively short hole, but it's not 380, like a few of those really short par fours. You know, get it in the fairway, and you're left with a mid-iron at this hole. 
Short par four, just 380, you know, pitch and putt if you can get it in the fairway. This one's not playing into the headwind. It's also a little bit longer than some of the other holes, but it's wide open off the tee. You'll see most players just bang a driver down there. Even if you hit it into this Zoysia rough, it should be a birdie look. Hole 13's 233, so a longer par three. Um, it's not as coastal as some of the other par threes on this golf course, like number 16, which we're going to get to here in a second. Um, but it is on the longer end of the spectrum. Hole 14 into that headwind, 392. You do have this bunker in play on the right as well, so it's not nearly as easy a hole as some of the other, quote-unquote, you know, sub 400-yard par fours. And you also have all these trees to the left. And there is an OB over there if you get far enough left. So uh, it's, a, it's a more demanding tee shot than you've seen for some of the other shorter holes. Uh, this is right about 400 yards, similar type of topography. You do have a few bunkers in play though, but if you take a driver, you can take all of it out of play. You have this cart path area to the left that you can get into, but you'll get free relief from. Uh, this is a really simple hole before maybe the most difficult hole on property, which is hole 16. It plays a little bit downhill, about two yards downhill, um, 233 yards over a natural area. So you can't really get full perspective here, but this is a cliff and uh, that's the beach and waves splashing down there. So you have to hit over the water, especially if the wind is coming off the coast. Like it will a lot of times you either play um, slightly downwind and with a little crosswind, like in this direction, from bottom left of the screen to top right, or it'll play pretty much directly from left to right. That's what we've seen a lot of years. Uh, if we get a really funky wind where it comes from, you know, back top right to bottom left here, um, in that direction, it's even more difficult, right? Because then balls are being pushed into the hazard so it's it's a difficult hole pretty much no matter what uh, but particularly if you get a little bit of a funky wind direction hole 17 is a 500 yard par 5 so this is going to be your best look at eagle on, on the entire property um, 500 yards gettable into you know you can lay up there if you'd like to and leave an, leave yourself an easy easy wedge shot uh, but most players are going to go for it and lastly hole 18 is a 408 yard par 4 relatively straightforward uh, get it in the fairway and you're going to have a wedge shot. Now that we've seen the golf course hole by hole, let's talk through our key stats for analysis at Port Royal. So number one, we've got shots gained approach, which shouldn't be a surprise, but really hunkering down on the short wedges, some of the shorter irons, and shots gained approach under windy conditions because there's a little bit of an art form deflating shots, getting some of those distances down. So those are some of the metrics that I'm hunkering down on for approach, but in general, it's always the most predictive stat from week to week. So typically going to be at the top of our analysis. Number two, shots gained putting on Bermuda. We've had winners like a Brian Gay, a Brendan Todd over the years. A lot of the shorter hitters on tour that are known for their accuracy off the tee, which is why I think a lot of people flock to accuracy as a stat. But outside of those two players, not a lot of accurate players have actually done well at Port Royal. It's more Bermuda grass putters. That's the one thing that has been consistent over a lot of the top five, top 10 finishers. So I got it at number two. I mean, anytime we're on a resort style, shorter golf course, the top putters are going to filter towards the top of the board. So I don't think that should be a surprise to anybody. And number three, shots gained in windy conditions in general. This is probably the one that might change right come Thursday. If we're looking at benign conditions over the weekend, this might not be something to hunker down on, but you know it's too early to tell at this point. If it looks like it's going to be windy, we have to look at historical wind stats. It's just such a huge factor around this championship. It makes flighting the ball of utmost importance. You've seen it at the Corrales Putacana. You've seen it at the Puerto Rico Open over the years. Mayakoba can get really windy as well. A lot of these coastal Caribbean tracks are really in an own league of their own. I mean, you don't see windy conditions like that unless you have extremely foul weather at like an RSM Classic or one of those coastal courses on the West Coast, um, which is extremely rare given how beautiful the weather is, especially on the West Coast of the United States. So these coastal tracks, especially during the swing season, um, some of the tournaments during like December, that sort of thing, are definitely worth looking at here. At number four, we've got shots gained around the green which could be important under windy conditions, driving accuracy, shots gained at short golf courses, something I'm looking at. So that would be less than 7,000 yards. Shots gained at coastal courses, shots gained out of Zoysia Rough. I'm looking at shots gained around the green on Bermuda. So specifically, not just, you know, in general, but also on Bermuda. Shots gained approach on Bermuda, birdie or better percentage, shots gained at comp courses, and of course, shots gained at good old Port Royal Golf Club over the years. 
All right, and lastly, our comp courses. So first off, we've got Pebble Beach Golf Links, the home of the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am, the shortest course on tour, a course that's only 10 yards shorter than what we have this week. So that's the main comp, but also difficult to hit fairways and greens. Now, smaller targets around that venue, also a little bit lower winds, but a lot of comparisons that can be made. And from a winner in top five perspective, you've seen a lot of crossover. Number two, we've got TBC River Highlands, which I seem to use a lot as a comp because it's kind of very specific where, you know, it has you know, this easy feel to it, yet the ball striking is a little bit more difficult around River Highlands than you see for most golf courses. And it's extremely short, right? Less than 7,000 yards. So I'm looking at that. That is the home of the Travelers Championship. And lastly, Albany Golf Course, which is the home of the Hero World Challenge. We don't have shots gain metrics there, but it's another Caribbean track. That one's in the Bahamas, where it's Bermuda. So similar from that perspective, an extremely windy short course. So it's less than 7,000 yards. It deals with similar like 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. So a lot of comps that we can make there, but it is a small field event. It usually only the tip top players, elite tier guys are even there, which none of them are in this field. So you got to look at it just from like the general skill set standpoint to kind of identify what kind of players have success at these type of courses and then try and, you know, use that same sort of mold or model of a player to try and find guys in this field. So that's what I'll say about those comps. I like, you know, Pebble Beach, River Highlands, and of course, Albany Golf Course. But that is all I've got for this week's course breakdown. Before you hop on out of here, go ahead and smash that like button. But also, go ahead and let me know in the comments what you think the winning score is going to be. A lot of it is weather dependent, and as of right now, the forecast looks a little bit volatile. It's changing. I'm going to assume that the weather's an impact at least two out of the three days. You say something like... 15, 16 under par wins it, uh, but you can tell I'm not all that confident about it. I mean, it changes wildly from year to year, but go ahead and let me know your thoughts down below. And until next time, guys, best of luck with any outright bets or any DFS lineups that you decide to make. We'll have content dropping for all of the DraftKings core picks, value picks as per usual, and maybe some content for the Live Golf event. I'll be down here in Miami for that. You know, it's about an hour drive for me to get down to Trump Doral. So I'll be at that tour event. Might even do a course breakdown for it as I've played that golf course uh, more times than I can even count. So very familiar with the Blue Monster, which is a track that used to play on the PGA Tour. So a lot of you have seen it before. And uh, one that I'm really excited for because it brings a lot of variance. There's a lot of water in play. It's one of the more difficult courses that I've ever played in my life. And to see tour players play it makes me feel a little bit better about myself because you're going to see a lot of guys struggle. So looking forward to this weekend, guys. Best of luck, you know, like I said, with any bets or outrights that you're going with. And I'll catch you guys next time.